welcome everyone to the Wilmette Institute's regular webinar series, which has as its purpose to highlight the immense diversity of the Baha'i teachings and the ways they contribute to the contemporary world and particularly to the prevailing discourses of society. Today, we will turn to the Baha'i view about animals. What is their nature? And what are the implications from their nature about ways we should treat them ethically? And this, of course, is, I think, a topic of great interest to many people. Speaking today will be Carol Flood. She is an animal lover, as you can imagine, she would have to be to do this presentation. <laughs> Uh, has been a Baha'i for some time, and both of these loves have grown over time. Professionally, she's been an educator and an environmental advocate, often combining the two fields. She has two master's degrees, one in educational psychology and statistics, and the other in environmental management and policy. She has taught environmental science at the college and high school levels and served as a sustainability coordinator at a private school. She has also worked for the Environmental Protection Agency and as an editor. She lives outside Maryland, well, Westminster, Maryland, with her husband, son, one dog, four cats, and lots of rural wildlife, who I hope do not disturb you too much because sometimes the wildlife can be interesting. Uh, so I will mention one more thing before we actually get started, and that's that I should mention um, some upcoming programs. For those of you interested in knowing what else we have coming, we do not have any webinars currently scheduled for May and June, but that is something we are working on. So we will probably have some webinars uh, in, during that period of time. But we do have one webinar in July by Jana Khodadad, who will be speaking about the banishment of Baha'u'llah from Baghdad to Constantinople and beyond. We also have several courses coming up. Uh, these are our online courses. Economics and community building starts in early May, and this is an interesting opportunity to look at economics as it relates to uh, neighborhoods. Introduction to Islam starts on May 10th, and then the Baha'i Faith and the Arts on May 31st. So without further uh, ado, I will stop sharing my screen, and I will turn all of this over to Carol so she can begin her presentation. Thank you, Carol, so much for joining us today. We are delighted to have you here and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much, Rob. I am so happy to be here and to have everybody who joins us here. Um, this has been a long time in the making. Um, I started um, delving into this topic de decades ago and started talking with Rob about a webinar probably a year ago. Um, so I'm very excited for anybody who's here to be here and anybody who listens above and beyond the, the present. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Um, so in developing what I thought was going to be a book that hasn't been completed yet, <laughs> my, um, my priority was to, um, to consolidate and um, bring together quotations from the writings about animals. Uh, it occurred to me probably 10 years ago that um, there are so many passages in the writings about animals that don't necessarily use the word animals. So um, one of my objectives um, today is to start to help us to think more about how expansive our writings are about animals. Um, so um, my motivate, whoops, sorry, my motivation today is is driven largely by um, well my personal love of animals, but um, also loss of global biodiversity. Um, you know, constantly hearing about species being lost. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, a an increased awareness of factory farming and cruelty to animals that is prevalent in our societies globally. Um, an increase in awareness of animal sentience and the teachings of the faith on animals. So um, an awareness of through, through observation and through scientific studies about how incredibly diverse and um, 
wide ranging animal abilities are. Um, we're learning more and more all the time about them. An increased awareness, an increased awareness of, of parallels with social justice issues. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. As for goals for today, uh, again, um, you know, as I've been doing this research and collecting th these passages, it's become um, increasingly a, a personal goal of mine to, to, to have Baha'is talk about this more. I've, you know, individually with, with Baha'is and, um, you know, in social media and so on, there have been discussions about it, but we don't seem to talk about it in our communities very much. Um, I do have a friend, maybe she's here today, um, who does a regular fireside and, and potluck with the focus on, on animals and, and a vegan diet. So, um, you know, so there's more and more all the time and there's probably lots that I'm not aware of, but um, my, my goal is that, you know, I hope we can talk about more about it more as just part of our religion. Um, and I will quickly make a, a little a little um, plug here. <laughs> I discovered a couple of years ago that there's a whole field of study now called animal theology. And I have several books, um, Animals and World Religions and a Communion of Subjects, huge books about um, the study of religion and animals. And the Baha'i Faith was not mentioned in either one of those. So it's like, wow, wait, wait there's so much here <laughs> that we can share. So um, in a field of discussion that's as wide ranging as animals, uh, you know, some people are just animal lovers like I am, but some people don't care so much about animals. It's not really that, that much of a concern in their lives. And I've been part of discussions that have been pretty, um, you know, contentious. So, you know, what does it mean for us as Baha'is and in a Baha'i community in our ever advancing civilization to find unity about um, animals? So as with the, the title of this webinar, um, Compassionate Era, my hope is that we can at least find a point of unity where we agree that wherever we're at, we're at least moving toward a more compassionate society for animals and that that is part of our, our, our teachings. Um, and then I will share just a, a few of the quotations that I found. Um, when I was putting together this collection of, of writings, um, I've, I've had at least about 300 pages of, of quotations that I think relate to animals. So um, <clears throat> I will share some of those that I found as well with you. Okay, so I will start with three short passages. One, this first one is from a, a prayer. <clears throat> Interestingly, it is um, in the section on mankind in our prayer books. Um, so all God of mercy before whose door the quintessence of mercy hath bowed down and round the sanctuary of whose cause loving kindness in its inmost spirit hath circled. We beseech thee, entreating thine ancient grace and seeking thy present favor, that thou mayest have mercy upon all who are the manifestations of the world of being, and deny them not the outpourings of thy grace in thy days. All are but poor and needy, and thou verily art the all-possessing, the all-subduing, the all poor. And Abdul Baha says, the spiritual world is like unto the phenomenal world. They are the exact counterparts of each other. Whatever objects appear in this world of existence are the outer pictures of the world of heaven. And a quotation from the Bab <clears throat> from the book Gate of the Heart. Whoever possesseth power over anything must elevate it to its uttermost perfection, that it not be deprived of its own paradise. So I often think of um, what our responsibility is to animals, since we have a degree of power over them. Um, what does it mean to elevate animals to the station of their own paradise? Again, with, over 300 pages of, of quotations, you know, these are just a few that, that kind of stood out for me as introductory statements. 
So today I would like just as a brief outline, um, just a little bit of more of an introduction, uh, some questions to consider that have come up for me as I've been doing this research, some readings to consider, you know, some of the passages that I've found that, you know, I'd like us to all think about uh, what can we do? And then we'll open up the, uh, the webinar for questions and discussion. So a little bit about my background and our biases. I think, you know, Rob already uh, gave an, an introduction and I'll, I'll say a little bit more in a second. Um, question, what do Baha'is generally think the faith says about animals? So I had to go back and kind of think about, you know, I, I grew up as a Baha'i, you know, what were my understandings of, of animals as I was growing up? What do I think, you know, what, what do we all generally think about, about animals? Um, in the context of history right now, what are our human impacts on animals? Um, we'll talk about that. And then perhaps more, most severely, the sixth mass extinction, um, which is uh, upon us, and a brief discussion of what animal sentience means. So generally, um, you know, I, I grew up as a Baha'i, as I said, I, I've always loved the outdoors and it, it, and became involved in environmental studies, environmental science um, as a second career. And only in the past, maybe three or four years have realized that one of my, the driving forces is my love of animals. So I wanna save habitat, you know, because it's for animals. So that's, it's, it's really a deep part of me. Um, I do remember as kind of a funny story when I was, when I was, uh, probably seven years old, I wanted to defend animals of all sorts. You know, a relative of mine was, was trying to torment a fly. And I remember coming at him with a baseball bat before somebody intervened. <laughs> so I didn't hit him with it. And I don't do that now, but <laughs> I just remember that that was an important part of my life and, and um, a love of mine from early on. Um, I, yeah, I do have I do have pets, and for those of, of us that are in the vegan world, that's not necessarily um, a great thing, but it's it's something that I've I've done for a long time, and it brings me closer to to the animal kingdom. Um, I am a vegan. I've been a vegan for about nine years, um, not exclusively. And for some people, the distinction between what a vegan is and a plant based diet is. Um, vegans try to eliminate animal products in their lives as much as is reasonable, reasonably possible to do no harm. Um, it's not about the diet, which would be called plant-based. So some people are, are a little confused with that difference. Um, I have found that I'm much, much healthier eating on a plant-based diet, but my primary motivation for doing it is my love of animals. So, But the reason why I put this here is because I think it's important for all of us to realize that we all come from a diff from different backgrounds. So if I were, for instance, an Inuit, depending on meat for my life, you know, I'd probably see things a little differently. Um, if I'm very poor, I'm and you know, and I need to eat whatever becomes available, I'm not going to be worried too much about my impact on animals, probably. So, um, you know, and and people are coming at this and their views of, of animals from very different perspectives. Um, one, one thing I do wanna say, there's a fantastic book that I'm reading right now called um, Beyond Beliefs. It is a guide to improving relationships and communication for vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters by Melanie Joy. Um, very interesting and excellent book about how to communicate with one another based on your different backgrounds. So just a little plug for that, it's a really good book. Um, we, you know, we come to our perceptions of animals um, from both an innate and, a, and learned experiences. You know, children tend to be very sensitive to animal suffering and feel connected to animals. They also are curious and they try to, to, to explore their dominance over animals. Um, you know, depending on the child and the situation, uh, you can see, and these are just my own observations. Um, Learned experiences, of course, we have our own personal experiences. We have our parents' example and how they treat animals, um, our formal education, 
our culture, societies help us form our perceptions of animals and our religions help us to form our, exam our, our perceptions. So this question, what do pies generally consider to be the high teachings on animals? Um, you know, I remember growing up just knowing that it was important to be kind to animals. Um, I knew that the animal kingdom was one of, of many kingdoms, uh, mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, human and spiritual kingdoms as well. Humans have a higher station than animals. Animals are physical beings only. And, you know, there were lots of other little um, understandings that, um, that I think about from time to time, but those were sort of the main things that I, I thought about as I was as I was growing up. And and then I started to become, as I said, more interested in deeper questions about animals when I started studying you know, the science of the environment and how um, and ecology and how animals were impacted and started to realize um, what factory farms were doing and so on. You know, I'm sure if you think about it, you know, you, you would come up with a bunch of other things that you've thought about as well. Um, you know, what is the station of animals? Are they spiritual? Are they just physical? And those those perceptions of mine have, I will say, grown. They've I've added to them. They're not as quite as simple as I used to think they were. Also, a burning question of mine, which I won't get into too much today, but um, you know, do animals exist in the next life? That was when you know a, a beloved pet of mine passed away. I wanted to know if that that was going to continue to exist. So that really motivated me, um, or has motivated me at different times in my life as well. <clears throat> so human impacts on animals. Right now we are having such an enormous impact on the animal kingdom without, I mean, if you are aware, then you're aware and it, you are probably intensely aware. <clears throat> um, we also, um, you know, may go about our lives without being aware of any of our impacts. So the animal, the agriculture and food industry has direct impacts on animals um, from inhumane confinement to um, the slaughter of the animals, um, the domination of, of animals um, just in general. Uh, indirect impacts from the agricultural industry, uh, deforestation, land use, uh, water pollution is a huge problem, habitat loss. So these also impact animals <clears throat> as well. Um, hunting, you know, I, we seem to see, at least I've seen a lot of, of stories in the news about overhunting and trophy hunting. Um, you know, hunting certainly impacts populations and family units and herds and packs and so on. Um, the question of pets, again, I, I wouldn't have thought too much about this except having my own pets, I realized that I, you know, could have um, financially supported a, a town or something on all the, the, <laughs> the amount of money I've spent on pets over the, over the course of my life. Um, so, you know, we make priorities and we, we put a lot of effort into, into our pets at times. Um, you know, even though I'm a vegan, I do feed, I have cats that are rescue cats, but I feed them meat. So, you know, that's, it's all, you know, these are questions about how, there are so many questions about how to, um, you know, how to live our lives uh, with animals. Uh, pests, the concept of pets, pests is really interesting. Um, you know, I, I have had a, a Native American friend who told me that there was no, in her tribe, there was no word for, for pests. Um, you know, so all creatures are just trying to live their lives and, and you know, be healthy and stay alive and so on. So there's, there's no, there's no, uh, no pests being a thing. Um, you know, we have medical research. We have the spread of disease from humans as we become much more aware with COVID and avian flu, competing for resources, question of wildlife and wilderness. What do we do with that? Biodiversity and climate change. So I mean, I need to move a little bit faster here, but so um, 
we are currently, according to experts, in the sixth mass extinction. There have been five other mass extinctions um, throughout the Earth that we know of. Um, this is a loss of biodiversity from all the kingdoms. Um, currently, we are at 1,000 to 10,000 times the natural background rate of extinction, and that is due to human activity. So clearly, we are in an era where we need to change our relationship to animals. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it's during the time of the Baha'i era. As a Baha'i, that's how I see things. So again, I'm going to skip over, skim over some of these slides because there's so much information. Um, so a lot of what our impacts come from are land use and um, climate change. So land use with our agricultural systems. A question that comes up frequently in environmental science and environmental studies is what is sentience? Um, and a you know, dictionary definition is the quality of being able to experience feelings. And we have in our writings a very specific statement by Alta Baha. I think it's in other statements as well. But in this one, for in all physical respects and where the animal spirit is concerned, the self same feelings are shared by animal. The feelings are one and the same whether you inflict pain on man or on beast. There is no difference here, whatever. It's a very clear statement about, about animals that they are feeling sentient beings. So that makes it necessary for us to not, can, not treat them as, you know, objects, um, you know, as commodities, I would say. We are also finding so much, as I mentioned before, so much information about um, animal capabilities. You know, I just watched a, a brief video yesterday from uh, Jane Goodall, and she was talking about how back in her day, I guess it was the 15, 1950s, um, you know, people believed that humans were the only ones that used tools, and that was what distinguished us from animals. And she's like, now we know, <laughs> you know, she, through her research, you know, she discovered that primates use tools significantly. We've also seen crows, ants, all kinds of other animals that use tools. And again, I'm gonna skip through this pretty quickly, but um, questions of self-awareness, there are interesting studies about that. Pleasure and fun, I'm gonna just mention a, a good friend, Jonathan Balcom, he has, um, authored several books on animals, including one about their um, about how they have fun and they find pleasure. So that you know that's not something that distinguishes humans from animals. Um, art, altruism, grief. Bees can count and do math. Apparently, um, some animals can recall past events and worry about future events. And there's some research that dogs can create sentences by using the word board. So some of the questions that have come up for me as I've been doing this research um, is, you know, the question of what is an animal actually? <laughs> if we are enjoined to be kind to animals, but what in fact is an animal? What are kindness and cruelty? Do animals have intrinsic value? What are social justice considerations? Do Baha'i statements on animals tell us how to make management decisions? And what can we personally do? And what can we do as communities? So I'm gonna just talk about each of these a little, a little more depth. So the Baha'i teachings clearly state the need to be kind to animals, but how is animal defined? So in many of Abdul Baha's writings, he talks about animals having sense perception. And in some others, he talks about animals um, having the spirit of animals. Uh, biologists use the following definition or something similar. An animal refers to any eukaryotic or true celled, multicellular organisms. So bacteria are um, single cell organisms and they do not have complete cells the same, in the same way. 
They're in the biological kingdom, animalia, generally characterized to be heterotrophic, so they eat others. They do not produce their own food like plants. They're motile and movement, have special sensory organs, lack a cell wall like plants. Yeah, the plants have cell walls and they grow from a blastula embryonic development. Now, normally we think of animals as vertebrates. You know, if, unless you are a biologist um, or a scientist, you may just think of vertebrates. So we've got five uh, categories of, of vertebrates, reptiles, fish, amphibians, birds, and mammals. Some of us only think of mammals as being animals or they might be the ones that you think of first without thinking too deeply about it. Um, of course, for biologists, invertebrates are also animals. So, you know, we've got spiders and snakes and sea stars and insects, so, and worms, you know, all of these things are actually part of the animal kingdom. So this is, as I'm, you know, to, to review, this is one of the considerations I have when I'm read as with a, a science background, when I read the Baha'i writings about being kind to animals. Um, you know, how do we do that to the animal kingdom? When the Baha'i writings instruct us to be kind to animals, which ones are they referring to? Cats and dogs, a little easier, chipmunks, mice, raccoons, getting into our garbage cans and so on, spiders and snakes, wolves, big question. Fleas and mosquitoes. So, I these as I said, you know, I'm not making a judgment call here. These are just questions that have come up. So, if these are all animals, what does kindness mean? So that is the next question. What does it mean to be kind? Of course, there's a wide range of what people think to be kind. I I often have that question when I'm, you know, thinking about my own pets, for instance, like. You know, my husband thinks I spoil our dog. So, you know, don't let her go too long past her breakfast time or that's not being kind. He doesn't say that to me, but it's sort of like this, you know, what is being kind and what is is not being kind, what is being cool. Um, so, you know, being sympathetic or helpful forbearing and gentle, sympathetic and, and uh, being forbearing. So that's, definitely. so, you know, we, I think it's important to look at these definitions as well. Cruel, it's actually in the Kitab Yaktas, in the, our Book of Laws, um, that cruelty to animals is prohibited. So being cruel means to dispose, dispose to inflict pain or suffering, the void of humane feelings, causing or conduce, conducive to injury, grief, or pain. So these are things, again, to consider when we're looking at our, our relationship with animals. Another question that comes up in um, in environmental studies, environmental science is the question of intrinsic value. So philosophical discussion, intrinsic value versus instrumental value. So does a species or an individual animal have intrinsic value that just by existing it has value or do we consider only to have value if it assists us in some way? So these, you know, um, it's another question to consider as we make decisions about our relationship with animals. Social justice parallels are pretty clear when you start thinking about the fact that humans have untowered, I guess is the word, <laughs> dominance and power over animals. Um, Social justice deals with domination of power over less powerful. Um, and we have one of our prayers even that God is de a defender of the little ones. How can we be defenders? Um, certain groups in society are becoming vegan as an action to combat social injustice. So I know we have some uh, African-American friends who are, who are uh, vegan for that reason. Um, women are also doing that in a lot of cases. There are several books related to that. One interesting one is, I think I brought it now, um, 
um, sister species that is really interesting and digs in, in deeper into these questions. Um, another question that I'd like to consider is what does it do to our own beings to become accustomed to dominating and exploiting other beings? So it's not, it's both the impact on the animals and the impact on our own souls that I think we need to consider. One more question is um, management directives versus principles in the faith. Um, you know, so an example from the environmental field maybe is um, when Abdul Baha says to change this world into a rose garden. I've thought about that quite a bit. You know, literally, we don't want the world to be a rose garden, and I don't think that Abdul Baha meant that. Um, so how do we take those principles and apply them to the real world? Um, and one of the main reasons that that came up for me is because of his statement about wolves, that we should be kind to all creatures except those that are harmful, such as wolves. Um, now, ecological studies, science tells us that top predators like wolves are, are key for healthy ecosystems. So when Abdu'l-Baha says, Know, to be kind to all animals, all creatures except those that are harmful, like wolves. Does he mean to kill them to wipe out the population of wolves, or is it possible to respect them and to just focus on protecting innocent animals that they or people? Like so? Well, wolves, at least in the United States, do not have a history of eating people, contrary to what a lot of people. Okay, so what do we do? What, what are some approaches we can take? There, I separated out personal from community action. Um, you know, a, a lot of it's the same. You know, look at the science, look at our laws and principles and the teachings, pray, meditate, reflect on the teachings, you know, focus on kindness and an advancing civilization. Um, in our communities, we can consult if we're trying to make a decision. And, you know, I'm thinking long-term also about you know, when our Baha'i communities become bigger and we need to make decisions perhaps um, locally about an, a situation with animals um, or maybe in even in a um, say a house of worship or a, a Baha'i center you know if if there's a problem with you know in, in animal infestation or something you know I, I'm not sure but anyway we can we can consult <laughs> I don't have the answers just I know we can consult um, and personally we can eliminate animal products as much as possible from our diet and lifestyle now again there is no law in the Baha'i writings um, that our diet should be vegan or plant-based there are many many uh, passages that encourage it but we cannot try to force that on anybody but as a personal effort, we can all take that step to you know, just go the next step, see what that is. And, you know, I, I'm there too. I need to take other steps as well to, to become there. So um, that is something we can all do. Um, so here we are in, in our um, section here about the actual Baha'i writings. Onion. So there are passages that specifically address questions about animals. Um, Abdul Baha, it seems to me mostly from what I've seen when he was in the West, in Europe and North America, many people asked him questions about animals and the, the similarities and differences between animals and people. So we have very specific writings about animals. Um, Going beyond that, and these were some of the things that I started to see when I was delving deeper, you know, just the, the word nature includes animals. So what do our writings say about nature? What do our writings say about creatures? All beings, oh my goodness, there are so many passages that use the phrase all beings, all created things, kindreds, dweller, uh, dwellers of the earth, and many others. So quotes on animals, also, so in, in the bottom here, laws, ordinances, and exhortations, prohibitions, cruelty to animals, that is on the Qatari Act. But at the top also, it says, burden not an animal more than it can bear. 
We truly have prohibited such treatment through a most binding interdiction. Be ye the embodiments of justice and fairness amidst all creation. Um, this one I chose, the last sentence is, is pretty interesting. It is evident that the natural movements of all created things are compelled and that nothing moves of its own will, save animals and in particular. So animals have a degree of free will, which is interesting. I mean, it, it's just one of those little gems that I keep finding hidden in our writings. Um, education uh, makes the ignorant learned, cowardly, courageous, crooked branch straight. Uh, through education, barbarous nations become civilized and even animals take on human-like manners. I really love this one too. The animal, the second paragraph here, the animal is the source of imperfections such as anger, lust, envy, greed, cruelty, and pride. All these blameworthy qualities are found in the nature of the animal and do not constitute sins with regard to the animal, whereas they are sins with regard to man. Um, and I'm gonna skip through some of these just to make sure I'm not going too long and that we leave plenty of time for discussion. Um, absolute repose does not exist in nature. So that would include animals. I also chose a hummingbird because I was thinking um, also that throughout the writings, various species are used as symbols. And so I think that's really interesting as well. Whales swimming in the ocean. Creatures. Now, creatures I, is an interesting word because um, it, to me, can mean either people or animals or both. So if you say in the prayer, I am, oh my God, but a, but a poor creature, to me, that means more along the lines of I'm just a poor soul and poor human being. <laughs> um, but some of the the passages are, they just seem so clearly to relate also to animals. So all creatures that exist are dependent upon the divine bounty. Divine mercy gives life itself. Um, and that mercy is shot on all creatures. This one is another example of um, where I would love to see expert translators dig deeper into this, these questions. Um, so I beseech thee by thy lastness, which is the same as thy firstness, and by thy revelation, which is identical with thy concealment, to grant that they who are dear to thee and their children and their kindred may become the revealers of thy purity amidst thy creatures and the manifestations of thy sanctity amongst thy servants. So what, what does creatures mean there? I mean, if Kent, can be the embodiments of, or the revealers of purity amidst other people. We could, in my mind, be revealers of purity amidst people and animals. But again, having expert translators would help to, to clarify some of these questions, I think. Um, If thou art sailing upon the sea of God's names, which are reflected in all things, know thou that he is exalted and sanctified from being known through his creatures or being described by his servants. Here's uh, the phrase, all beings. Um, you know, and, and as I was putting together this collection of, of passages and quotations, a lot of the passages have multiple terms and phrases that I think can relate to animals. So it's hard to really separate them out. Um, a drop of the billowing, billowing ocean of his endless mercy hath adorned all creation, ornament of existence. And a breath wafted, wafted from his peerless paradise hath invested all beings with a robe of sanctity. So uh, very, very prevalent throughout our ratings. 
course, this is a great passage um, about the, the earth. Now, not, we shouldn't let the earth say, I am to be preferred above you for witness how patient I am in bearing the burden which the husband then layeth upon me. I am the instrument that continually imparteth unto all beings the blessing with which he who is the source of all grace hath entrusted me. All created things. All creatures are eaters and eaten. The fabric of life is reared upon this fact. Were it not so, the ties that interlace all created things within the universe would be unraveled. Um, this one, peoples and kindreds of the earth. Um, again, a, a good translation would help clarify this. But in, for instance, in this sentence, every aggressor deprives himself of God's grace. It is incumbent upon everyone to show the utmost love, rectitude of conduct, straightforwardness, and sincere kindliness unto all the peoples and kindreds of the world, be they friends or strangers. Does that relate to just people, or can it relate to animals as well? Because we know we need to be kind to animals as well and then i would just leave that as you know meaning to be kind to peoples but then later on in the paragraph it says the light of the sun shineth upon all the world and the merciful showers of divine providence fall upon all peoples the vivifying breeze reviveth every living creature and all beings endued with life obtain their share in peace. so and we do have several i'm gonna again try to just zip through these there are Quite a few teachings about diet. Medical science is only in its infancy, yet it has shown that our natural diet is that which grows out of the ground. The people will gradually develop up to the condition of this natural food. Are we there yet? No, it, what will be the food of the future? I think this was said in you know the late 1800s, early 1900s. Something to consider. So just, uh, I just threw this one slide in here just to, to consider all of these different questions. Uh, you know, things that I haven't really talked about yet, developing spiritual qualities. What qualities do we want to develop? Um, you know, and how does that relate to how we treat animals? You know, are we striving to be more powerful and dominating or are we striving to be kinder people and gentler people and loving people? How does that relate to our treatment? Uh, the material world is a metaphor. Huge questions and um, you know deep spiritual meaning there. Uh, when we look at the most great peace or an ever advancing civilization, how do we get there? Is that something that we think of as just in the future that we're just waiting around for that to to happen, or can we take steps now to move toward that? And what what our relationship to animals look like when we get to a place of the most great peace? And I love these little guys. So I had to put one of those pictures in there. But um, how can we continue the conversation? So, you know, as I said, as individuals, I've had so many conversations with people about these topics. Um, can we expand that in our communities? And how do we do that? Um, I came up with this list, which as soon as I finished it, I heard my 19 year old saying, okay, boomer. <laughs> so I don't know, how do we, how do we continue talking about this? Um, you know, I'm so grateful to Rob and to Chitra Golistani for, for allowing me and encouraging me to, to follow through with, with this webinar. Um, what else can we do? Um, have fun, continue finding passages on the writings about animals, you know, these, all these other terms and phrases, it just is so exciting if you love animals or, you know, want to expand your understanding of this. If you have skills, help with refining translations. I think that would be so, it, with, with the um, goal of trying to understand what the passages mean with regard to animals. Um, if you want to email me, I have a special email set up so you can just focus on sending me an email, compassionateera at gmail.com. Um, I have started a list listserv discussion group um, please contact me if you wanted to be added to that. 
there's quite a few Facebook pages and ones that I know. I started Baha'i Teachings on Animals, but I think there are two of us in there now. Um, there's a, a relatively active Baha'i vegan and vegan Baha'i parents um, Facebook pages. I, you know, others may be related to it as well. But I don't. Um, I'm thinking about putting together a study, study guide so that people in communities can, can uh, you know, deepen on this topic. I'm starting also a, um, an organization called Neighbor, Neighborhoods for Wildlife, trying to keep it really simple, but basically to have people in neighborhoods work together, get to know the neighbors and expand habitat in their local area. I think it would be great for, for kids through the elderly to just work together and do something positive that will also help animals help. Uh, donate to animal advocacy organizations. I know our community at one point donated to um, a rescue organization. You know, and, and people in the community see that guys actually care about animals too. Um, begin to think of the faith as one that advocates for compassion to animals. I, 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 you know, as you look more at these writings, I, at least for me, and you know, I'm, I'm willing to see things differently, but as far as I can see, it definitely moves us in that direction. Um, so maybe we can start to think of ourselves openly as um, a community that advocates for animals. Now deepenings, other, you know, whatever works for you personally and some, you know, summer school classes, whatever. Um, so final words, it's no coincidence that we live in a new spiritual era and that there is so much suffering in the animal world caused by humans using practices developed in earlier times. Indeed, we need to change the relationship between humans and other creatures as soon as we can. The Baha'i faith gives us guidance and principles as well as laws. We can be aware and we can put effort into bringing about a more compassionate world through our daily personal lives and in our lives. Um, and again, I tried to focus the title of this this uh, webinar on moving toward greater compassion towards animals. Is that something, is that a point of unity? Like there's so many negative contentious discussions about animals and everything else, but can we at least agree that we're moving in that direction toward more compassion? Um, how do we contribute to an ever advancing civilization? And what is our purpose in life? If it's to develop qualities, which ones should we develop with regard to? So I think that's it. Um, there are some references and further reading various topics. So I am ready to hear what you all have to say. Thank you so much, Carol. This was fascinating and I enjoyed yeah. looking at it a second time because uh, <laughs> it helped, helped remind me of the various points you were making. Uh, I'm sure we will start getting some you know, comments. And I want to urge people, if you have questions, not to use the chat, uh, but to use the Q&A, because that's just it makes it a little simpler for us to keep track. Please don't raise your hand because we have too many people to go hunt for your microphone and your camera and turn them on. Uh, we would much prefer that you just simply type your questions in the Q&A. If you have to use the chat, we can always find it in the chat too, but it's just easier if everybody puts it in the Q&A. And then we will be delighted to uh, you know, raise those questions and have a discussion with Carol about them. One question has occurred to me, Carol, and I think we were talking about it earlier on Friday. Uh, we note in the writings of Baha'u'llah that all created things reflect a quality or an attribute or sign of God. And I think that's, first of all, it, it tells us that we learn from any created thing, uh, something about the divine. And that I think is, is a really important insight about nature for us. I do wonder whether, considering that there are, what, 30, some people say 33 million species on the earth. I used to hear two or three million or four million, but now I'm hearing absolutely enormous numbers because now we're beginning, beginning to count microorganisms better and microbial species, which we had never had an easy way of, of, of counting before. Presumably there aren't 33 million attributes of God, though maybe there are for all I know, <laughs> maybe there are even more than that. <laughs> right. uh, but I do, I do wonder how, how this all relates, whether 
some species, for example, will reflect an attribute of God better than other species and um, uh, these kinds of questions. And so this is just speculation, but I was wondering if you thought about that. Oh, definitely, definitely. You know, when, you know, you look at like the puppies from the first slide, you know, the little uh, uh, Labrador puppies, you know, they're adorable, you know, the quality of adoration I think of, you know. Um, you know, it gets a little harder sometimes when you look at maybe mosquitoes. There, you know, they're, 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 it's a little hard. But, but because of those statements in the writings, you know, I, to me, all it, we don't necessarily know right away what those qualities are. But because of those statements, it seems that we have to have some sort of respect for them. You know, and and I think that's a really good point that you know we there's a lot out there. There's a lot to learn from all of the different creatures on the planet. Yeah. So yeah, good, good question. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Eileen says, please comment about our deceased pets and the afterlife. Oh. <laughs> our pets and all animals have spirit and spirit cannot die. Oh my, <laughs> you know, as I think I said, this is one of the, the, motivating questions early on um and for me you know i i've had so many pets that i have loved so dearly they're just totally family you know um when people down the road somehow i ended up moving into a house where there's a hunting camp like next door um i didn't know that when we moved in you know it's like i it, it kills me every time deer are, are are hunted you know um so couple of things. I remember as maybe a 12 year old asking my aunt who was a Baha'i um, this that same question. Um, and she said that Abdul Baha was asked by a woman if her beloved dog would be in the next life. Uh, her dog would pass away. And Abdul Baha's response was, if you need him to be there, he will. And so that, that, um, that satisfied me as a 12 year old, <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay, good, I'm sure I need him. And now I'm like, well, I don't know if I need him, but I want him there, <laughs> you know? Um, so what we have in our writings is that there is an animal spirit um, and not, again, I really, really, really want people to, to help with translations on this because it is so important to some people it may be not just to others but it's so important you know there's an animal spirit but animals do not have individual spirits is what um seems to be in the writings um i'm starting to be a little more satisfied with that so if there's an animal spirit and my beloved dog is manifested in the physical world through the animal spirit. I think I'm maybe okay with that, you know. Um, but I wouldn't have been a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> um, one of the reasons I put that that statement in the beginning of the talk is that all things in this life, you know, are reflections of the spiritual world. That gives me a lot of comfort um, when I'm thinking about my beloved pets um you know i'm not sure exactly what it means but um and one other point there is so i know i'm not answering your question but i don't know that i have an answer to the question but one other thing is that in paris talks i believe it is which again there are some questions about the translations of paris talks abdul bahas makes a statement um something about the souls of people and then he says as for the souls of the lesser creatures so um what you know is that a bad translation i think there's a lot of mystery around what souls and spirits are even for people um yeah. so keep looking though and if you find a good answer let me know <laughs> yeah and, and the comment that your aunt made um, that Abu Baha said, if you need the, your doggy in the next world, you'll have him. I've never seen in writing. I have right. heard it quoted by people. Yes. So you do wonder whether it really does go back to Abu Baha or not. 
exactly and one would like to certainly would like to know that um, exactly yeah and and uh arthur uh, has included uh in his q a a quote from abu baha the poem unless ye must bruise not the serpent in the dust yes. how much less wound a man and if ye can no ant should ye alarm much less a brother harm so this is a there a you go absolutely a, a marvelous absolutely. example of of serpents and ants which are certainly not mammals uh, that's right <laughs> <laughs> and i also down the chain right right and i also um remember a story from i don't know this point where it was from but of baha'u'llah in i guess it was the garden of brisbane but i don't remember um and the garden was being overrun by locusts the gardener begged baha'u'llah to get rid of them mm -hmm. and baha'u'llah said basically and i'm totally summarizing this but but they need to eat as well and but the gardener was really upset so baha'u'llah you know waved his robe and they flew away now to me that's kindness right that's he's he's not making them all drop dead he's not saying they should be killed he's just saying go away they they have a good life too you know they need to live their lives as well so you know we have stories like that in in our history as well yeah yeah that's a good I, that story is actually told by the guides when you're there in yes. the garden of resvan actually that's right. uh that's when, right. you're, when you go on pilgrimage because this is the garden of resvan in israel not the garden of resvan in iraq Right. Uh, and and I think I heard that story from a guide when we were there. I agree. Yeah. Yep. I, it's been a while. But yeah. <laughs> Arun asks this interesting question. Isn't following veganism as a means of pressuring animal based industry to stop operating trends to bring in a political factor? Isn't regulating industries a subject of national laws rather than people pressurize, pressuring uh, them to change? Well, it's probably both. I think, you know, the more people get involved and change the laws in a democracy, at least, you know, that's theoretically how that should work, right? If if um, if enough people choose not to eat meat um, or animal products, you know, the laws will begin to change. I think there's a lot of people that are, are working in that, and you know what I've seen is a lot of people that are just eating a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, and 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 industries are changing to accommodate that. So, um, you know, at what point it really becomes laws or part of the the national legal system? I don't know. And, and different countries operate differently. I think I'm trying to remember there. Somebody had mentioned recently that in England, um, some significant law has changed regarding animal welfare so you know it, 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 i think we're all moving in that direction actually well <laughs> i think we're sort of split i think a lot of people are moving in that direction and there are more and more meat eaters in some parts of the world too that are you know don't that's really true. care so that's true that's true uh in the more uh westernized countries there's i think growing awareness of of veganism and vegetarianism and the harm to the environment that uh, and to climate change that is caused by eating all this meat uh, the amount yes. of greenhouse gases that cattle release is absolutely enormous um, uh, certainly countries like india where they've long had a, a, a tradition for ve for vegetarianism mm -hmm. um, that that still continues though i suppose even there people are eating more meat and certainly in china i've heard people are eating more meat yes that's what i've heard as well uh, yeah the uh, it seems to me, as you said, a lot of people are vegans or vegetarians out of personal conviction and not necessarily out of political um, persuasion um, right. because they feel that it's just the, the right thing to do because animals shouldn't be killed. And right. uh, and other people would have that plus their political concerns. Right. And um, I think it's, it's actually interesting. Um, I was listening to someone who um, is advocating for a, a plant, at least a plant-based diet for health reasons. Yeah. And there's a lot of science right now that shows that, that show the positive benefits to your health too. So, you know, even if it's not your main goal, the, um, 
you know, the impact on animals decreases if you're plant-based diet. So yeah, de decreasing the in input of uh, intake of fats in particular, um, animal fats in particular, and ones that are high in cholesterol, um, right. certainly is an issue. Yeah. Uh, Kathy says, outstanding, thank you. <laughs> Would you comment about some answered questions, chapter 36, where it refers to the five kinds of spirit, the vegetable spirit, the animal spirit, the human spirit, and then there's also the um, the spirit of faith, and the, and the mineral spirit is the other one, of course, that she didn't mention. Um, have you any comments about that classification of spirits? Well, I... I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for. Um, I would say that it's, to me, when I hear that, it means to me that all creation is spiritual. And I, I think that's, you know, a shift that I've, I've made in recent years. Um, if you look at indigenous perspectives on nature and, you know, um, all of those kingdoms are spiritual. And you know, we overall need a sense of respect for those kingdoms. Um, I, I think that is actually in our writings as well. But you know, when you when you dig a little deeper and you start looking at the whole body of of um, passages and, and comments in the writings, you know, you, you begin to see that as well. I think there's a a great connectedness between indigenous beliefs on, in nature and the Baha'i teachings. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, I think one of the very interesting things about the five kingdoms is that each of the kingdoms they're like nested dolls. You know, you've got yeah. the, the mineral That's kingdom, crazy. which basically involves cohesion, cohesion, and and attachment of things. The plant kingdom includes that, but adds growth. The animal kingdom includes both of those, but adds perception. The human kingdom adds all three of those, but adds rationality. And then the kingdom of faith, or the state, the state, the um, state of faith adds to all of those a uh, a sense of, of faith. Yeah. So it's it's really quite quite interesting that way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, an anonymous person actually raised this question about native peoples. They, they say, it seems that the native peoples of the Americas had a special relationship to animals. Consider the white buffalo calf woman. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I often think about um, how that's true, that's been true throughout human history. You know, I, I, you know, I think of the Egyptians burying their cats with them, you know, to go to heaven with them. You know, what was that significance that they felt for those, um, you know, the, the Brahmins in India and the sacredness of the cows, um, you know, there's um, just a very long history of, of, you know, at least certain animals are, 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 are very respected and, most cultures, I would say, but yeah, the the white buffalo calf, um, and just the general attitude about about animals in native cultures is is very significant. And I, and again, you know, I I really see a lot of parallels between the high teachings and indigenous teachings on animals. Yeah, yeah. Christine says, "Thank you for a great presentation, Carol." Thank you, it Christine. reminded me. Christine Muller, yeah. <laughs> I figured, hi, Christine. You know Christine. Yeah, you know Christine. Uh, it reminded me of the word who said that scorpions are not evil in themselves. They are only harmful to others. On another topic, topic personally, I understand Baha'u'llah's words that all created things are a sign of God in a more general way. Of course, we could see grandeur in a mountain and collaboration in an anthill and beauty in a butterfly. But the incredible beauty and diversity of all of nature collectively teach us the greatness of the creator. Beautifully said, yes. Yeah, isn't that, That's isn't when that you lovely. put it all together. <laughs> it's really awe-inspiring. Yes, very uplifting. Thank you for that, Christine. Yeah, I love that. That's a very nice, nice way of putting it, really. Very nice, nice way of putting it. We have run out of Q&A, but I suspect if we wait, we'll get some more. Uh, so I don't necessarily want to shut us down quite quite so quickly. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah, I I don't know what what a better way is to to if people want to consider to continue the this you know 
dialogue more. I just, you know, I personally am longing to to really get into the nitty gritty with people about it. So, um, you know, anybody who's interested, please, you know, get in touch or, you know, or do your own thing. Go out and, you know, teach a class on it. Have firesides, you know, whatever. <laughs> I would love to love to see us again. I think, you know, there's certain religions that take themselves to be, um, you know, lovers of animals, you know, I mean, indigenous religions and cultures, um, you know, Buddhists generally. Um, I don't, did I say this already? Was I thinking, I, I have two, two books that I got several years ago. Um, it says, this is called A Communion of Subjects, Animals and Religions, Science and Ethics. Oh. And um, Animals and World Religions. Um, they both are part of what is a somewhat new uh, field of study from what I understand called animal theology. Um, in neither of those very densely packed books is there any mention of the Baha'i faith. So I think, you know, the more we can write about it, the more people will recognize that it is an integral part of our, our teachings. And, you know, and, and, and if we start to think of ourselves as, as a religion that is kind to animals. I mean, it is part of our religion. So you know, yeah. let, let's talk about that. Let's, let's make sure that we incorporate that into all that we do yeah. as much as we can. Yeah, and I think where cruelty is concerned, you raise, raise a very interesting question of defining the issue of cruelty. And clearly, if you are living in a society where you have to hunt animals, the actual act of hunting the animals and eating them is not cruel. It's a question of how you kill them if you can avoid them suffering, yes. for example. Yes. Exactly. But in a society where we are today, increasingly, I think people would say that even the act of killing the animal is cruel because we no longer need to eat them. So I think the concept of cruelty to some, to some extent is shifting and to some Absolutely. extent it's also is cultural. Absolutely um, true. Yep. Yeah. True. And, I, and I think, you know, I... Um, I've had a couple of interesting conversations with, um, with some Native Americans about this. And, you know, there's some that say um, that in the past, yes, that's been necessary, but we know now that it's not necessary. So let's look to the future. And, you know, I think the, the faith when we're looking at an ever advancing civilization, again, I think I said this earlier, like, do we wait for that to come or do we take steps now yeah. because we know it's possible? Yeah. to make things better you know and and um you know like end of the statements on eating food that comes from the ground i mean to me it says he says this is what we know to be true our teeth are not meant for eating animals we know that it's healthier to eat so we already know that we can't force it on anybody because you know it's not a law but if we personally recognize that and know that that's true you know then let's do it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know and it's and, and, and i say this like it, it's it it's a process too you know i my husband and i uh, became vegetarians i think 30 years ago you know for the for environmental reasons and for you know animal cruelty reasons um but then it took another 20 years or so before i realized that you know the dairy industry and the egg industry aren't so great either in, in a lot of ways yeah. but you know, then, so I kind of became a, a vegan nine years ago, but, you know, I couldn't give up no chocolate for a really long time, <laughs> you know, and it was, and, and I, I will say this too, like vegans get a bad name, a bad rap because they're considered judgmental and, and harsh and so on. Maybe some are, some are not. I have to say that anytime a vegan has been judgmental of me, like for feeding my cats meat and so on they're not wrong yeah. ethically they're not wrong like you know it may take me a while to get there though so yeah. i think it's important to realize that the, the difference you know it, it takes people time to get to yeah and there are probably not that many animals being slaughtered to make cat food because the things the cats are being fed are the things that the people won't eat now, the animals are being slaughtered for feeding humans and it's the it's the, the byproducts beef, beef byproducts yeah which yeah. is a fancy way of saying various 
things with you know parts of the body that that people won't eat so to some right. extent i'm not so concerned about that i guess i could say right um, although you know it's it's interesting in this book that i mentioned before beyond beliefs a guide to improving relationships and communication for vegans vegetarians and meat eaters it's really interesting because um the author says which is true to me too it's like when you see somebody when you see meat if you're a vegan for ethical reasons and you really care deeply about animals, it's sort of traumatizing. You know, yeah. it's like seeing a, a somebody eating, you know, a puppy or, you know, yeah. animal, like because we see no difference between yeah. a sheep or yeah. a cow or, or a dog. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, but at the same time in this communication process, vegans have to realize that it's a process and that people aren't going to necessarily be moving that fast. So it's hard to be if yeah. you're judgmental, that's not going to create a good situation either. Yeah. Yeah. I was raised on a farm where my father yeah. killed, well, we had we raised pheasants. He killed pheasants all the time. And, and, uh, yeah. and uh, we ate lots of, of pheasant eggs because they were available. And the pheasants that he killed were the ones which were often being picked up, picked to death by the other pheasants because they are very, <laughs> they're very hierarchical. Right. So, right, yeah. right. so that, yeah. So you know, I, I to me, to me, meat is just sort of a natural part of life, or was as a kid, and that's what where I still yeah. am coming from in many ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Christine has another comment here regarding the prayer, quote for uh, for all that are the manifestations of the world of being, unquote, and references to creature. My understanding has always been that they certainly include animals, but also plants. What are your thoughts? about you know manifestations of the world of, of being would include plants as well. Right. And you know, this comes up in, in discussions among vegans as well, because <laughs> often vegans will be asked, well, you're killing a plant. So, you know, is that okay? And and you know, there's research now that shows that um, you know, plants also send out communication. You know, there's a kind of communication among trees and, and plants and so on that actually I listened to a fascinating uh, sound thing the other day. So somebody measured the sounds that plants emit when they're being cut. And mm -hmm. it's actually like, it's a sound. It's like they actually, you know, cause now we can measure it, but and that's crazy to me. But, um, you know, maybe in the future we'll all be few um, fruitarians where we just pick the fruit. We don't actually kill the, kill the, uh, the plant. But the difference to me is the feeling, the sentience and the degree that, uh, you know, plants do not have senses right and we know that from biology and from our writings you know so so that to me is the difference yeah yeah it's a chemical communication and not right not a not a nerve system nervous system that's sort what of exactly. exactly yeah but a lot um, of people i have that question so yeah that's a good question I, I i make another comment too about about um cruelty to animals when there was a period of time here in the united states where women went out wearing for coats, they had to worry about something them throwing red paint or red fake blood on their coats and that kind of thing. Sure. But when I was in Denmark, there was a woman there who had a beautiful sealskin coat, and she said, "You know, the reason we own we wear these is because we're trying to support the people in Greenland, because Greenland is a part of Denmark, and they have to export something. Right. So right. one of the things they export are animal skins." Right. And so the Danes are very concerned to be able to support the traditional cultures sure. in Greenland. So I, th I thought that was a very interesting example of how in one society, something is encouraged, another society discouraged. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is a question, you know, yeah, how do we encourage, you know, like indigenous communities and, and, and countries, economies and so on without doing that, you know, is there some other way that they could they could support them? Yeah. You know, it would be a question I, I'd have. Um, yeah. and, and again, like if we are intentionally creating a future that is kind and compassionate, what can we do differently? You know, that, I mean, that, you know, how will our agriculture change? I, I think, and I, I really want to start a whole discussion about that. Like what will, how will that change if we believe in the teachings of the most great peace and an ever advancing civilization? What will our world look like if we are not eating animals? Yeah. How will that change our agriculture? And what can we do now to move closer to that? Yeah. And how can we 
preserve some of these animals that we enjoy. I mean, there's, uh, I understand dairy farms where when the cows feel their udder is full, the cows walk over to the rotating, right. rotating milking machine and simply get on and they're milked and then they won't go back to their stall to eat. So <laughs> they have freedom, you might say. It's, and it's quite intriguing. There may very well be ways that that uh, eggs and milk can be provided in some very humane uh, ways for those animals. Right, and yet if you're uh, if you're looking at it from a vegan point of view, um, you know that the forced impregnation of the cows is not okay. The taking of the calves from their mothers so that we get their milk and the cows don't, or the calves don't. You know that's that's not okay. Um, you know eggs. I don't know how attached chicken mothers are. You know hens are to their eggs, but you know I don't know. I'm not sure, but you know that it depends on how you look at it. We're we're yeah. still dominating. Yeah. Another species. So yeah, absolutely. These and these are again issues that Baha'i writings will help us resolve. I hope exactly. in the future with a lot of consultation and poss possibly with different different answers at different times too yes yes exactly yep. great questions yeah and uh, and and uh, and thank you very much for bringing all of this to our attention today sure. i don't see any other actually i think there might be another one here let me see oh yeah we've got a couple of more um now one person was just talking about drinking milk and milk products being not so cruel so we just covered that one um alvin says, I encourage our presenter to please write a book. The subject is so important and her research and approach is so needed to provide a conversation from the Baha'i perspective on this issue. All the questions she has raised and presented are so pertinent and right on point. Her presentation and approach is so wonderful and heartwarming for us animal lovers. So grateful to have had the opportunity to know that a Baha'i is so committed to this subject and done so much research on it. Grateful, grateful, grateful. Aww, thank you so much, Ellen. I'm so thankful and grateful for you too. And thank you for that statement. Yeah, I, I, you know, like I think I said before, I, I started out wanting to write a book and then, you know, I get near the end and I'm like, oh, I didn't even include this whole thing. And it just, it's a huge, huge undertaking. So if anybody has book writing experience and they want to help me out, I am open. <laughs> I would love to think, think of each one of your slides or every yeah. pair of slides as being a chapter. <laughs> there you go. Way. And Let's actually, actually, <laughs> I, I did kind of take from the structure of the book and 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 make the slides that way, so I could go back the other way too. I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's that's I think one of the the main tricks. One of the most difficult things to write something of book length. So you're used to writing something twenty pages long, and you have to kind of figure out how you're going to join all those together. And that, yes. that's tricky. That's tricky. You'll yes. figure it out. One person, Jan, Jan asks, who is the author of Beyond Belief? Um, that is Melanie Joy, M-E-L-A-N-I-E, -E, last name Joy, J-O-Y. Great, great book. Good. And and I think she, she, it's it's very dense. Like there are things that having been a vegetarian, you know, a mediator, sorry, I was a mediator until I was, you know, in my 20s. You know, meat eater, veg vegetarian, and vegan. Like I have never thought of half of these things. So it's a really yeah. very thoroughly researched, very good. But but be ready to really get into the nitty gritty. <laughs> and people good. may want to look at the ethics of Jainism, where where creatures are concerned, because the Jains are they have rules that they can't eat um, um, potatoes and things like that because that's where the plant comes from. But they can eat grains and. Uh, it's really right. very interesting. I, the I'd like to know more about the way they came up with their decisions and what hierarchy of beings. I'm not sure they consider there being a hierarchy since they're concerned about inhaling insects even. So it might be right. a very interesting set of some ethic of ethical principles there that we yes. may want to. Yes, I've been wanting to look to. into that a little bit more as well. Yeah. yeah. Examine. I know. Well, I, I think often of the of the Baha'i writings that, you know, I it seems to me like everything is moving in the direction of being more compassionate. You know, change your diet, change your lifestyle, become, you know, advance our civilization to be to the most great peace. Like, you know, um, like 
what is that going to look like? But th there are a couple of things that make me, I guess they put a little bit of a limit on them. Like, you know, as Abdul Baha says, with every breath we breathe in and, you know, a myriad of animals, like, you know, that's a little bit like, okay, you know, maybe there is a point where it's too much, you know, like you've yeah. got to live, right? But other than that, you know, and it's pretty clear to be kind to the wolf or to another predator, you're in a sense being unkind to the prey. Yeah. Again, I, you know, I don't see anything in the writings that says kill off predators though. You know, right. are there ways that we can protect? And I know there are, you know, I don't, not in every situation, I suppose, but, you know, we can protect the prey and that's, you know, not being kind to the predator. Right. You need, you want presumably to protect the sheep and yeah. the goats, which the poor farmer is dependent upon from right. the depredations of the wolf, because then the poor farmer is stuck. But right. in the future, the, there may not be poor farmers <laughs> dependent upon sheep and goats either. Exactly. Exactly. Or less I don't know. Dependent. In right. the West, farmers are realizing they need to accommodate the wolves, and the wolves very yes. rarely kill very much from them That's occasionally, right. but not very much. So, so That's there's. Right. Um, and there, there are ways is. of compensating farmers if they do lose, you know, cattle or whatever. Um, yeah, and, and again, you know, for wolves, um, you know, my Native American friend, Paula, that we, we talked about before, you know, she, she did mention to me too, I remembered after you, you said something about mm -hmm. what she said to you that, you know, when the wolves were, the last wolf was killed in Ohio, she felt like she had been killed. You know, part of her spirit had died as well. So it's, you know, how can we <clears throat> follow the Baha'i teachings and also, you know, respect these cultures, I mean, uh, together, you know, yeah. what, what do we do? How do we do it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, let me see. I think oh, we've got one more, I, but they pop in and I don't always see them. Uh, Gabriella says, I would love it. Uh, if you could write a book about how you transition between eating everything to being vegetarian and then being vegan, I think many people would find this interesting. So that might be a good article, good place to start. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Um. It, it was definitely a process. You know, I think I. I, I grew up. I and. I don't know if I would eat manufactured meat, <laughs> you know, or the the cult lab cultured meat. But I have to say, you know, I grew up, I love the taste of meat, but, you know, once I realized the impact I was having, and again, I think it, it started probably from my environmental concerns about, you know, carbon emissions and methane. Yeah. Um, and then I started thinking more and more about how I felt. And actually that was a big transition because I, you know, looking at the science, and then looking at my religious beliefs and looking at my own personal feelings, you know, I had to sift all those out for a few years. And then I was like, oh wait, the Baha'i teachings say exactly these things. And then it all came together, but um, it was a process. A process. Well, that's a good summary and perhaps a good point for us to close today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining the Wilmot Institute's webinar today. We hope that you will share some of the ideas and information that you've heard today in conversations with others. And please tell others about this webcast. We look forward to seeing you again at a future webinar. Thank you again and have a good Thank day. Thank you so much. You too.